I think my first job is to tell you that we're going to leave plenty of time for you to ask questions. And if you have them, you should uh, fill out cards and uh, give them to the folks who are collecting the cards. Uh, Cynthia is back there. Uh, she is one of those people. But uh, the first question that I have to just get the ball rolling, um, as, as was said before, you, you've been working on this film for, for more than 10 years. And uh, it was completed in May uh, 2016, well before uh, November 2016. Uh, does it feel more timely than you could ever have imagined it would be? <laughs> Well, I, I guess uh, uh, Dateline Saigon is the unexpected and unanticipated beneficiary of the Trump election, so perhaps some small good thing has come out of it. Uh, no, I, I, I had no idea that, uh, uh, that what would ha uh, be present today uh, would be present today. When I started this film, it really uh, came out of... Um, uh, a couple of uh, uh, thoughts I had. I had spent uh, a few weeks in Vietnam as a field producer for CNN covering one of the anniversaries of the end of the war. And I met a lot of uh, reporters. Some of them had covered the war and were back for a reunion. A number of others were still working journalists. And I heard some terrific stories, uh, especially some of them quite late at night uh, at the top of uh, the Rex Hotel outside the bar, probably some of which were even true. Uh, and um, uh, I thought I wanted to capture some of these stories. I also uh, I, uh, came to some sort of a, uh, a political consciousness uh, during the Vietnam War. I remember when I was... <coughs> oh, I think in eighth grade, arguing uh, with a camp director about the importance of stopping the communists and beating the communists in Vietnam and why we had to support what our government was doing. And only a few years later, I was marching uh, in the streets against the war. So this was an opportunity for me to, to go back and say what happened and, and give me a chance to, to look at it all over again and try to figure out what happened to me and what happened to the country. This one I, I sort of have mostly for you, Joel, but uh, it's, of course, open to everybody. Um, this film looks at a, an era in which uh, reporters in a conflict zone had, uh, for time, unfettered access. And then the more truth they revealed, the more fettered their access became. And obviously, for journalists today, access remains limited at best, even not in war zones, and is often sort of highly curated and manipulated, is, you know, what can we learn, you know, uh, both in conflict zones and out of them, you know, uh, what can today's journalists take from their experience and their solutions? Um, well, that's a, that's a pretty big question. Uh, <laughs> but but so, so let me, before, let me, let me make another observation about, about what was portrayed in that film, which was just how anomalous uh, that moment was, really, for the media. I mean, you have to remember, you know, 15, what, 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 so 15 years before, um, you know, during World War II, there was a national censorship board. Uh, journalists did not cover conflict independently. It was, it was uh, uh, a concept that really uh, basically didn't exist. Um, if you were uh, covering a military conflict as an American journalist, uh, you uh, wore the uniform uh, of the military and the um, uh, Geneva Conventions, uh, which were um, uh, ratified uh, after the First World War, codified uh, that relationship. They basically said that uh, journalists who were uh, accompanying military forces and wore the uniform of that military force uh, would be treated as, uh, if they were captured, um, as prisoners of war. And this was considered a great protection for journalists because prior uh, to the, co the, the development of these, this specific um, uh, uh, um, uh, aspect of the Geneva Convention, journalists could be executed as spies. So this was a protection. And then you look at, at, at Vietnam, and that was really the transition there. You see that when the journalists are out there uh, covering uh, conflict, they're often wearing uniforms. Uh, Neil Sheehan was talking about you know, picking up a weapon to defend himself. Um, 
uh, they they you know they went out uh, and they had a certain identification. I mean, with with the military, but they you know the, the reality that they uh, encountered uh, caused them to redefine their own relationship. And and then here's what was what's 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 really amazing is in 1977 uh, there was an additional protocol to the G Geneva Convention and that codified that relationship in international law. It was a new provision that basically said that journalists who accompanied, uh, who, who covered conflict uh, independently, um, in other words were not incorporated into the military force, must be treated uh, as civilians. And so that kind of relationship, and, and that still exists today. There are two ways in which journalists uh, cover conflict, both uh, as incorporated into the military forces and independently, and you have different uh, kinds of protections uh, depending on uh, the way in which you, 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 you function as a journalist. Uh, but, but Vietnam completely changed the course and, and redefined the relationship that the media has uh, to the coverage of armed conflict, and despite the challenges, um, we, we can talk about those in a moment, and, and they're certainly a very significant. Vietnam, in, in so many aspects, but, but in that one in particular, was a, was a, was a sea change. Mm -hmm. if, if I could follow up on that, Robin, and well, first of all, congratulations on a really amazing work, and the fact that it... <laughs> the fact that it took 10 years, shows in, in the film. Um, but to follow up on what Joel was saying, um, one of the things that struck me watching it, and I'm still processing it now because I just saw it for the first time, uh, but one of the things that really struck me was that in, in one sense these correspondents are much more cynical than their peers in the sense that they were mistrustful or they grew to be mistrustful of what the government was saying compared to the Time Magazine correspondent, they were more skeptical. They they became disillusioned, perhaps at an earlier date than than others. Um, and yet, in another sense, I was struck by watching their testimony that they were also so much more naive uh, than than we are now, and that. They didn't see what was coming. They didn't, they didn't know the depths of government lying. They, they were shocked by the deception that they did greet, but they had no idea how far would that would go. And they had no idea how, um, how much division there could be within the country about a war uh, com because they were coming off their experience in Korea or, or World War II uh, and they were also naive in a way, in, in a sense that they they believed that if they just told the truth, that this would have an effect, <laughs> which yeah. we're not allowed to have that illusion now because lots of times journalists tell tell the truth and it doesn't have any effect. So that's one of the things I thought was so amazingly effective about your film is that it portrayed these young men, these correspondents, as both more cynical and kind of seeing through things, but also completely naive. Actually, that uh, sort of uh, answers the question that I was going to ask you, so I'll just jump to the next one, which is that uh, uh, this film shows reporters dealing with a White House, or maybe we should say another White House, uh, that uh, that tries to dismiss facts or, or treat them treats them as a, a, a point of view. Um, how do you see this as being, you know, the same or different from what we are grappling with now? Well, I'll I'll try to take that first. I uh, I think that. Uh, given uh, the attitude of the current administration, calling the enemy, uh, call, pardon me, calling the press the enemy of the people, uh, the stakes uh, have have been raised. Uh, the electricity, uh, uh, the amount of electricity has been raised. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's, uh, and this is my own personal feeling, having examined what happened, uh, what we saw in this film 50 years ago and now, uh, I, I think it's a lot worse. We did hear President Kennedy uh, uh, being frustrated and, and his cabinet being frustrated because these uh, reporters were, were an inconvenience. And, but I think it's, uh, it's gotten a lot worse now, and I think it's a lot more dangerous now, that which the White House is doing. Yeah, I mean, w one observation I had was um, about the size of that. I mean, you were, you were focused on, uh, on five journalists, and there, there, were, there were others there, but there, there, wasn't, there weren't a large number. It was a relatively uh, small number. And um, I mean, this is just a more general observation about how the, how the media uh, landscape worked. But I mean, the, the, the perceptions of these individuals were so powerful that they transformed the way the whole country perceived the conflict. And I think that, that it was precisely that, which you can hear that in the way um, for, that you know Kennedy and 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 McGeorge Bundy and the officials talk about it is you know these are a bunch of kids you know what do they know and they're having such uh, influence over uh, over o over the way the entire country uh, 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 you know the, you know understands uh, events that are taking place now and now when you look at the media landscape and just how fractured and and complex uh, it is and how. Uh, how there's so many competing narratives battling each other. Um, it's, 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 just, it's just amazing to contemplate that the power that that small group of individuals had uh, to shape our perceptions of, of, of those events. Yeah, what's, what strikes me is that uh, Kennedy was concerned about the uh, conflict between the image of the war that he and his advisors were trying to present, and then the shattering of that image by the correspondents like Havelstrom and his, and his colleagues, and, and that was a problem. That was, that was, a, that was something that he, he tried to um, muse about with his advisors. Uh, what's, <laughs> what's different today is that the current occupant of that office wouldn't be so much concerned with that as as how to discredit mm -hmm. those reporters and make sure that his supporters didn't mm -hmm. believe anything they said, where that didn't seem to occur to Kennedy. It's like, let's make war on Halberstam. That wasn't one of the options on the table. Uh, and I think and that's... And he did lean on the... On the on you saw him yeah, he tried to prevent them from doing <laughs> it. And yeah, I, I don't know about that because I think that they, they, they um, certainly used... I mean, you saw that there was a... You know, Time magazine was portrayed as, um, uh, you know, undermining and, 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 and basically carrying water for... The, right. and, and that was... And if you, I mean, the, the reporters thought that was very deliberate. They thought they were being... Manip the, the, those journalists were being manipulated... Uh, into sort of undermining the narrative that they were trying to present. Yeah, so but but conducting culture war against David Halberstam yeah. wasn't like an option on the table. <laughs> yeah, it's true. For it's true. for Kennedy, uh, let me just um, uh, pivot back to the point about naivete. Mm -hmm. uh, when um, uh, these uh, these were young men, th and they were really the first to be skeptical of the war. There was a comment made. Uh, by uh, Neil Sheehan, I believe, later in the film, saying we were outliers. Maybe it was David. Uh, and um, they really were. 90% of the coverage of the early years through uh, uh, 65, 66 was very favorable to, uh, to the American government position. These people were really on the outside. And, and in terms of naivete, when they came over, the, uh, and I think uh, uh, David Halberstam very emotionally, as did Neil, uh, talk about how they wanted to believe mm. what the government was saying. They, they were boys during World War II. They came to a patriotic consciousness then. Uh, they, they were young men when, uh, during the Cold War, so they were really cold warriors. It took them a while. They went over there and initially were all reporting favorably. So they all went through something of a crisis of conscience themselves to 
come to report so critically? I've got one more, and then I'm going to open it up. Uh, at the end of the film, uh, David Halberstam says, when the government is telling the truth, reporters become a relatively unimportant conduit to what is happening. But when the government doesn't tell the truth, begins to twist the truth, hide the truth, then the journalist becomes involuntarily, infinitely more important. Uh, uh, how should we look upon our new era of involuntary importance? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose is the optimistic way of uh, looking at our current situation. Well, uh, uh, David's words are ever so much more important today. What year was that when he said that? Uh, that was shortly before he was uh, killed. I think we shot that in 2007. Uh, David, uh, the 10th anniversary of, uh, of David's death was just last week, by the way. Um, so it was, it was very uh, shortly before. Uh, before it happened. Uh, please, I don't want to, I would love to have any of you comment on that. Oh, as well. I, th I think it's the emotional heart of the film. I mean, I think that's the, you know, that's that's when everything comes, comes together um, and, y and you set it up brilliantly um, because that, that, in a way, that's, that, that perception is the beginning of the adversarial press, the idea of, of an adversarial press. Um, and I think what we're grappling with now is that we have an adversarial press, but there's a, another, a, like an, a further evolution where the government is trying to um, discredit, not only discredit that press, but break off a portion of the public and and so that the president, our current president, can speak directly to that 20 to 40 percent of his base and make the president the primary source of information for that base about what the White House is doing. That is an amazing development uh, in the history of the adversarial uh, press. But I think it's, a, it's incredible that you that you that you got that quote from, from Halberstam because, because that's the origin of something that now is like in peril. It's in peril. Yeah, I, I, I think that that really was the, 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 the essence and the kind, the, you know, the kind of lesson that is the straight line from you know, Vietnam to Watergate to the kind of modern can, you know, framework that, that many journalists have when they uh, decide that this is the profession uh, that they want to pursue. But, you know, another moment that resonated for me in the film was, and I don't remember who, who it was, it might have been Halbert Summer, or, 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 I, I don't recall, was talking about how personally painful it was to feel the, the kind of orchestrated criticism, if you will, uh, of their role and their efforts, and how they felt in their own minds that they were engaged in a kind of patriotic exercise, um, and how how just undermined and demoralized they were by, by those attacks. And I think that you know we're living through that now on a on an, you know on a massive and unprecedented scale because it's orchestrated and it's systematic and it's deliberate, and it's not an effort to undermine the work of a handful of specific reporters who are reporting things uh, you know, that, the, that, a, that the government might find um, objectionable. It is the entire institution uh, and the whole exercise of independent journalism that, that's, that's under attack. And uh, so that, that was a, a moment, another moment in the film that resonated powerfully. With yeah, it's not, it's not just they're under attack. It's, it's, it's a coordinated um, assault that starts at the very top of the hierarchy with the President of the United States leading the charge in a way, with the press as enemy of the people. 
Then you have at the base of the pyramid, you have an army of online activists, trolls, bots, foreign agents, trying to discredit the press, attack uh, stories that they don't like. And then in the middle, mediating between the top and the base, you have institutions like Rush Limbaugh, Talk Radio, Daily Caller, Drudge, Breitbart, etc., that that mediate between the top and the base. So that's like far more sophisticated uh, operation than just attacking reporters that you don't like. So that's another sense in which their their uh, their sadness about about being attacked for telling the truth is almost naive, yeah. right? Compared to what we face today. Yeah. All right, uh, let's let's take some questions. Cards. I'm just gonna pass the mic around and people can awesome. raise their hands. Forget the cards. Put the cards aside. <laughs> We, we are going to use the cards. It'll be a mix. A mix. <laughs> OK. Uh, this is for Tom. As the film says, your five heroes were among the US press corps as a whole, exceptional. Most of the White House reporter, uh, most of the Vietnam reporters, sorry, uh, swallowed the Pentagon line. Why do you think that was? And why didn't more of the others experience crises of conscience? Well, I, um, for one, uh, one thing, these five uh, individuals were extraordinary reporters, uh, extraordinary uh, human beings. They were very courageous. They they looked inward. They analyzed things. Uh, they didn't uh, accept. They didn't go to press conferences and repeat the press conferences in their dispatches. Uh, I, uh, so uh, perhaps that's the most important reason. And then, then I, uh, uh, another part of it, and I'd like to, uh, to uh, hear the other panelists' view on it as well, is most of the others um, uh, were under pressure from their, uh, uh, their news gathering organizations, whether, for example, in this film, we saw the UPI, but there were also many other uh, print publications uh, uh, which didn't want to have the government criticized and wanted to have stories of the hometown boys, and they were mostly boys uh, back then. I mean, that's, I, I don't think I can elaborate further since you know, this, this is your, 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 your story, and I don't know what motivated uh, the other reporters, but I mean, just again, taking, drawing, drawing from the film, and, and knowing Peter, I mean, P Peter Arnett certainly was, you know, one of the, 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 the founders of, 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 of CPJ, and I, uh, wor you know, worked with him and traveled with him on, on CPJ missions. Um, you know, he was just one, he, he's one of the most intrepid reporters ever in the history of reporting. And uh, and I, I, I the other the other uh, uh, reporters you portrayed in the film sort of have that same uh, approach. I, I, I doubt there were many people who, frankly, you know, had the had the guts and the and 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 the and the and the and the kind of determination to get out there and see for themselves. And you know, that's that's a dichotomy that still exists today in journalism. You know, the people who go out there and want to see it with their own eyes and want to experience it, than the people who you know are. Uh, uh, like to you know maybe get a, the more official version or comment. Um, so that was just a, really a takeaway from the film yeah. that I had. Uh, reporters have this interesting expression, foreign correspondents, of going out, which means a lot different than like what it would mean to an adolescent teenager. So going out is leaving the press room, leaving the official confines of your beat, and going out into the countryside, into the into the, yeah. the into danger. But I want. By way of commenting on your remarks, Tom, competition yeah. means something very strange within the world of, yeah. of uh, beat journalism. Uh, reporters think of themselves as intensely competitive creatures, like nobody in the world is more competitive than they are. Um, but what they mean by com competition is everybody competes for the same story, 
but wants to get it five minutes sooner, right? It, competition doesn't mean a totally different definition of the story or a completely different sense of who's believable or where the truth lies. That, they don't compete on those grounds. They compete on grounds of everybody kind of agrees what the story is, and then I try to get it five minutes before you. So what's, what's different about these reporters is that they were competing on premises, on credibility, on who's credible, on, on the, the entire thrust of the narrative. W one other point that I, uh, that I do want to make is that uh, so many of the reporters, as, as so many, as the majority, the vast majority of people in this country were caught up in, in the Cold War, uh, were caught up in understanding that it was us against the Soviets or us against the Chinese, and that colored the whole philosophy. It, it covered, colored their reporting. Uh, Halberstam, Sheehan, Peter Arnett, uh, and the others were able to break through that. It wasn't easy for them, but uh, I think it's a lesson, and I've talked to, uh, to, to other reporters uh, who are covering conflict today who are struggling to sort of break through the accepted wisdom uh, to, to see what the real truth behind it is. Yeah, I mean, I just note that the, the, the thing that most, again, I, I'm not, I don't remember who said it, but you know, the thing that most offended uh, one of the one of the, the the reporters was the the implication that they were sitting in the bar, yeah. getting that that was a grave grave insult um, after they'd uh, you know risked their butt to go out there and, and tell those stories. Hi, so I'm going to actually read the questions that I've collected. Um, some of them are actually for Robin and I'll still be coming around to collect more. Uh, so this one is for Robin. Uh, a fair amount of research in political science suggests that facts have little influence on the partisan positions of motivated reasoners. How does ProPublica contend with this phenomenon? I actually don't think that we sort of buy into that notion. Uh, I think that we there there are definitely people who maybe cannot be reached by facts because they are so sort of uh, either extreme or or uh, just cemented to the ground in their in in their views. But I actually think that we have found that lots of people can be persuaded by fresh facts. Um, ultimately, I, I guess we uh, on some level have we need to believe that. <laughs> because we're gonna keep presenting facts. Uh, we love them. Uh, we're, we're sort of addicted to them and uh, we can't quit them to Brokeback Mountain it. Uh, but uh, I think that um, <laughs> we actually feel like, uh, you know, facts combined with moving and powerful storytelling uh, continue to bring us greater and greater readership so uh, we we have every reason to believe that that uh, we haven't uh, we haven't reached the last person that we that we possibly can. So there's a little dash of optimism. Okay, I have another question over here um, for anyone on the panel. We've about 15 minutes left, so maybe um, whoever jumps in first. Um, obviously, the White House deeming the media the enemy makes for a very different journalistic climate. But do you think it's harder for journalists to speak truth to power? and shine a light on world conflicts in an era when it does feel like a lot of mainstream media has an agenda, often based on the news of those who fund their, these sor their sources. Where does this leave us in our search for the truth? Well, I think it's important to distinguish between journalism as a craft and, and uh, occupation with a calling and the media as a sort of industrial complex that um, monetizes our attention. And a lot of journalists have to work for the media because that's where the jobs are. Um, but their calling and their principles sometimes cut in a different direction. And so they're caught in this um, institutional setting where what they might want to do and what the employer requires them to do is not exactly the same thing. So lots of times what they end up reporting 
is sort of a, a hybrid product between what, what they would do as journalists and what the media requires of them uh, as an industry. And I think a lot of viewers, listeners, readers, users of the product are, are totally onto this. And this is one of the reasons why trust in uh, the news media is uh, declining. And this is, this is one of the reasons why we're searching for alternative business models that would allow journalists to do what they, what they ought to do. But when people perceive commercial imperatives um, overcoming journalistic truth, they're not wrong. Um, so we have room for about two more questions. Some of these are difficult to read, so I'm going to do my best. Uh, okay, this is for Tom and the panel. Do you feel the massive shift of public opinion during the Vietnam War, due in part to the reportage of these five journalists, had more residence than today because the stakes were higher for the draft age for men? Look, um, I, uh, I think it continues to be debated, and, and I debated it with the, uh, the people you saw on the screen, whether uh, what the impact of their reporting was. Uh, each of them, to a person, um, felt that uh, they failed to, to break through with their print reporting at any rate. Uh, Mal Brown talked about this a bit at the end of the film, but once he was able to... Uh, to get on TV, he saw it had a much, uh, much more Im powerful impact. Uh, Halberstam said the same thing. Um, oh, uh, I, uh, I, I'm struggling with with trying to come to uh, <laughs> to a conclusion uh, uh, to an answer to that question. Maybe I'll pass it off to uh, to one of you two, one of the three of you. I, it's uh, it's it's difficult for me to uh, to assess the answer to that. Well, I, I remember my brother registering for the draft, and I remember I was too young, but he had a number in the in the draft, and I remember us hoping his number was low or high, whatever it would be to you know exempt you from the Vietnam War. And I, I do think that. That that sense that not everybody is eligible to fight, um, I think that has an effect on how people view uh, America's entry into violent conflict, and and I think that does change change the politics of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in some in some ways, it seemed that the you know the resistance came from the notion that this war was unwinnable. You know, that they, it was it was not the fact that people were dying; it was that people you know the take John Kerry's claim, we're dying for no reason, you know? So, and I think that was a narrative that, that, that you know, was created by, you, know, you, see the, you see the beginnings of that here, and certainly as the war progressed, you know, that became dominant. And I think, you know, if you, if you think that you're being asked to make a sacrifice for your country, uh, you want it to be meaningful, and if what you're encountering in the press is that it's pointless. Uh, that's that's got to create a, that's got to feel very real. And I think um, w w because of the draft, many more people were involved in the war than are involved in our wars today. So it touched many more families, yeah. which caused many more people to pay attention. And once people started paying attention, yeah. uh, with the groundwork that uh, the the people we saw in this film. Uh, 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 was being laid by them, and then others who came after uh, uh, were really reporting from uh, from a point of view that had been established. So it all it, it kept building, and we kept l not winning. Yeah, and uh, World War One, World War Two, Korean War. You didn't have journalists letting the public know maybe this is not the country you thought it was. Mm. But in Vietnam, you did. 
Okay, so here's our final question, and it actually kind of uh, covers other ideas that similar that other people had. Um, what do you think these esteemed journalists would think about the retreat of mainstream media from going out and getting the story? I'm a working journalist, and we do a lot of collection from the web and a lot of what's called UGC collection, user-generated content collection, in order to report, especially in foreign conflict zones. Um, and we rely oftentimes on people having an internet connection out there, or activists like the White Helmets in Syria, to understand what's happening. Um, um, and that happens for a lot of different reasons. Insurance, right? They can't insure their guys to go over there um, without having a pretty deep set of pockets. Um, um, and, and a lot of other factors, which you guys all know because you're all uh, in the industry. Um, so I find that a, 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 a lot, of, a lot of, of larger organizations have pulled back from some of these areas that we have our blood and treasure invested in. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering what the gentleman you know and interviewed and know intimately think about the retreat from going out and getting it. These guys made their names on being there. And because they were there, they were able to do, they were able to break ground. I uh, am certain that they would be very disappointed at the uh, pullback on, uh, on foreign coverage. They'd be very frustrated. Uh, at the same time, it really, uh, for many uh, men and women covering conflict today, it's much more dangerous uh, than it was uh, in Vietnam. So uh, I think that that's a, a, a big difference, a big uh, distinction. Nevertheless, with the uh, cutbacks in foreign coverage, which you alluded to, um, with the, the danger, so it's uh, very difficult to go into some of, these, uh, some of these areas, so you have to rely uh, on, on people who have an internet connection or who can blend into the local uh, scene. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a very, uh, very different environment. And two follow-ups on that. One is the, the origin of almost all authority in journalism is something like this, uh, I'm there, you're not, let me tell you about it. Hmm. Or I interviewed that person, you didn't, here's what he said. Or I looked at the documents, you were raising your kids and going to work, you didn't have time to do that, so let me tell you what I found. Uh, and to the degree that journalists aren't allowed to do that kind of work, they lose authority. Um, second observation, today, still, many journalists are in danger zones and conflict zones and, and uh, deadly situations trying to bring us news of what's going on. You, you deal with us all the time, Joel. Yeah. And I think the press, as an institution, should be much more vocal and forward about the sacrifice and danger that its members are in to bring us the news to fight the kind of hatred and dis attempts to discredit the institution that they, that they face now. I mean, these are people on the front lines. But the kind of authority that the uh, reporters in this film have results from the fact that they are able to say with conviction, I'm there you are not there, let me tell you what I found. Yeah, and, and, and I, think, I think another part of that is, and, and this was true in, 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 in Vietnam as well, if you talk to these reporters, they will talk about all the support staff they had mm -hmm. uh, in uh, the bureaus, the, the Vietnamese staff, many of whom, uh, or some of whom certainly were uh, left behind and suffered grave uh, uh, consequences as a result. Um, but today, that, 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 that kind of relationship is even more dramatic. I mean, you, you, you sort of described it. Um, 
you, there are a lot of places that journalists can't get to. I mean, yes, it's, it's always better, as Jay said, to have that first-hand observation, but there, there are places you can't get to that, that journalists have to cover. Um, and they can't get to them because sometimes it's too dangerous or sometimes they don't have the resources to do it um, or there are, there are multiple other reasons. And really what the global information ecosystem depends on to a tremendous extent uh, are local journalists, activists, sort of purveyors of information, these eyewitnesses, if you will. And now those, you know, those eyewitnesses are using this technology to transfer their knowledge to journalists who then report it. That's not ideal. Uh, but it's still, it's still in some circumstances the, uh, the best option. And, and the other thing we really have to recognize, and throughout the history of conflict uh, and uh, coverage of, of that conflict by journalists, is, is the role of these uh, local stringers, fixers, support staff, or local journalists working for the local for the local media who sort of inform our understanding of these events. And again, if you look at our data at the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, these are the people who are on the front lines. These are the people who are getting killed. These are the people uh, who are going to jail. And these are the people uh, we depend on. We depended on back then, and we still depend on today uh, to keep us informed. Um. To that, I'd, I'd only add uh, one or two thoughts. Uh, one is that I worry, given how much we rely on people that we used to think of as being sources as to be themselves reporters, uh, I think that uh, that divide, ha the, blur the blurring of that line is a troubling thing and would have been troubling, I think, to the reporters in the, in the film and is troubling to me. Um, the other thing that I saw, certainly in the last, especially in the last part of my sort of active reporting career, is sort of this almost fake access to the field that sort of proliferated the uh, the embeds that you could get in places like uh, Iraq that were sort of access but not access, uh, sort of go this way, go that way access. Um, I think that the reporters in, in the film found ways to break through that. They developed networks of their own sources. They, they, they found ways not to be in that echo chamber. And in some of the conflict areas that we, we deal with in the world right now, uh, it's, that is extraordinarily treacherous because there are no clear lines at all. Uh, it's just all chaos. But at the same time, those techniques and those practices and those uh, ideas, I think, are still probably uh, the way through it all. Um, anyway, that's, shall we leave it there?